what we'll understand about the brain these days is we have networks in the brain that are involved in trauma. Networks means what is talking to what. And basically, we're talking about uh, habits. We're talking about what's our habitual way of being in the world. And how do these net networks get activated? So the, the networks that people talk about is starting off the default net mode network. Who are you when you're not doing anything? What is your experience of yourself when you're not watching stuff and focused on the outside, when you're with yourself? That's the default mode experience, very damaged by trauma, as I'll show you in a minute. Uh, so that's one state of being, your relationship to yourself and your continuous habit system in your brain. The second piece of the, uh, of the brain that's important is your brain figuring out what's important, what's unimportant. It's called the salience network. Uh, what do I pay, pay attention to, what I don't pay attention to? And as you know, if you know anything about trauma, when you're traumatized, your salience network is really messed up. And that minor things that for other people are not so important, for you become a very big deal. And things that are a very big deal for other people don't be any, anything to you. And for example, for me to go into a bar room where there's some really tough looking people who are getting drugged, uh, my warning system, my brain goes off like, get the hell out of here, I may get hurt. Some people with chronic trauma go into a situation like that and they can't detect how dangerous it is. Their brain doesn't pick up that they're going to get hurt. Happens all the time in our field. Uh, so, so how do you change the salience network so you know what's important versus what's unimportant? And the third network in the brain is the central executive network that when you decide to do something, that you actually do it from beginning to end, which is also very damaged by trauma. And so the, it's a very pervasive damage caused by trauma. And I think we're just barely beginning able to scratch the surface on how to change all that. Uh, it really starts with my old students, now very much a person of own right, uh, to my mind, she's one of the two best neuroscientists in the world in the area of trauma, is uh, Ruth Lanius. And she does a study a few years ago that is really important. And she puts 16 uh, perfectly normal Canadians in the scanner. There's some Canadians on this webcast. You know, you guys have a nor lot of normal people in Canada, which feels like you have more normal people there than over here. Um, and so they put these normal people together and just say, just lie there. And in a little while, we start a real experiment. And so these self structures of the brain come online. Uh, this is the part of your brain that decides what you're going to have for lunch. That's the side of the brain that decides what dress to wear today, what activities to get. It is you knowing what you like and what you want to do. And what's also really important is that the back of your brain, huge, is in charge of taking care of your body. And it's very, always very active that in your unconscious brain, you tells you how often to go to the bathroom, how much to eat, when to take a nap, all this sort of stuff, and how to breathe. That's the back of your brain about, it's about taking care of yourself. Um, so it is normal, Canadians, normal people actually. Uh, so-called normal people, because I've met very few normal people in my life. Um, then she puts 18 very traumatized people in the scanner, and the self disappears. The front of the brain, there's nobody there. There's nobody home. And the back of the brain has also sort of disappeared. So there is no there there. When traumatized people are, often when they're not exposed to danger, uh, they don't feel anything. When they get exposed to danger, they actually start feeling alive. So this is a very big deal that I wish we had more time to talk about, is that when non-traumatist people are putting a scanner, just doing something, lying there, uh, think about things, the self system gets on, online, and when you get not traumatized and something unpleasant is presented to you, you become active to see what you can do about it. Uh, so in response to unpleasant situation, you leave yourself and you become active. That's the opposite of what happens in trauma. Under ordinary conditions, the brain is quiet. There is no self there. You don't feel yourself. You don't know what you want or need. And, but when you get involved in bad situations, 
you start feeling alive. And so traumatized people tend to seek situations that may actually be quite troublesome because on some subliminal level, they feel alive. And so now the question becomes, what is the default mode network? And the default mode network is the part of the brain that is active when you're with yourself, it appreciates beauty, it appreciates, and, uh, and it is your habits. And so uh, our friends who know us, our colleagues who know us, know what our habits are. Oh, don't bring that up with him because he'll become upset. Oh, if you want to really be nice to him, do the following things. Huh? So the, our brain, our habit system, our default mode network has set up a lot of automatic programs in our brain so that under ordinary conditions, when you drive to the grocery store, you don't have to pay attention to where you're going. Your default mode network gets you there. And when you're talking to somebody in a store, uh, you don't have to think very much because your default mode never gets you there. And so our habit brain is terribly important because it allows our mind to pay attention to subtle new details. But if your habits turn out to have been based on trauma, on hurt, your default mode network is geared towards trauma. It's towards dealing, towards feeling unpleasant. I wish I had a little bit more time because it's very clear and good research has been done that is that the way you get out of the habit network in the brain is to pay attention to your sensations in your body. And so I'm uh, not going to take the time to do it, but I, on the ordinary condition, I say, now think about something that's really bugging you right now. And we take it in and see what it's like for you. And then it asks you to go like, so wheel your big toe and you feel your big toe and feel the back of your shoulders and feel your body and notice your breathing. It will take a while. And then what you'll see is that after you have paid, to, paid attention, the sensations in your body, that problem you were dealing with, takes a back seat. And so but it's becoming clear because of the work of uh, Farber and Farb and uh, Zindel uh, Siegel is that our sensory system is the counterbalance to our habit system. And as we learn to feel our bodies and notice our bodies, we can take in new information and we can begin to grow. Uh, so uh, that, that is, uh, here's a good example. Uh, that, um, you automatically react to things. So it's again from Ruth Lanny's lab, uh, Paul Fruin did a study, and they built a three-dimensional little cute guy who I call the dark, handsome stranger, and they showed this dark, handsome stranger to a bunch of um, well-contented uh, Canadians. And when they see that, movie, that picture, uh, there's a group of women, um, their front lobes start working, and they start thinking, oh, uh, Boy, I wonder if he likes my marinara sauce. I also I wonder if he likes to play tennis, or I wonder if he likes my favorite band. So if you see a potential partner, you get excited about the possibilities you can do. Then when a bunch of sexually abused women look at the same dark, handsome stranger, what lights up in the brain is not their prefrontal cortex thinking about how much fun they have together. What goes, what gets activated is the most uh fear-based system in their brain, so they are terrified seeing a dark, handsome stranger. As if these are automatic reactions. And so how do we deal with these automatic reactions? We learn to activate our salience network and to feel sensations and to notice our sensations both around us and sensations in our body that affects the temporal, the, the parietal cortex, and, uh, affects the insula of this brain and it allows you to rearrange your relationship to yourself and you slowly learn how to be master of your own ship and to change your habit system. But what uh, Farb and Siegel show is that the only way you can really do that is by going inside and paying attention to your body. Okay, um, so there's much more here, but let, yeah, let me end up with these statements. I was going to talk about psychedelics, but um, we don't have time for that. Uh, so 
He is an example. Twice a week, a small group of men inside San Quentin State Prison get together and practice hula. But not the touristy stuff you're probably thinking of. This is the cultural practice of hula, which is actually more like a moving meditation than a dance. And for a few inmates, it's helping in their rehabilitation. So Kumu comes in and he's like, yeah, all right, guys, so get ready, I'm going to teach you hula. And he's like, hula. <laughs> Upu Ama was one of those men in the hula classes. He served a long sentence inside San Quentin. I served 24 years for murder. Patrick Makuakane was his teacher. Yes, so Patrick just won a, a McCarthy Genius Award for you. I'm delighted about I went to St. Quentin last month. It's fantastic, actually. They, they really understand. They, they use the body keeps the score as sort of one of their prison manuals, old prison effort, and they're really doing fantastic work there with movement and synchrony and meditation and programs to really change people. I'm just blown away by it. Um, the other thing is we should Please be put your hand mindfully on your anchor spot, your heart or belly. Breathing in, breathing out. Nice, Taylor. One minute of mindful breathing all by yourself with your hand on your anchor spot, your heart or your belly. Which one do you use, your heart or your belly? Your heart? Okay, so you're going to really feel your breath here. When you notice about your noticing. We're working on being curious about things we hear outside of ourselves and inside. The next thing we're going to do is use the glitter bottles or our mind jars. Um, yoga time is ending. So I'm just showing that as an example of how we can help people to get into their bodies and become owners of their bodies. Yeah, you know, I could show you much more, but um, no, our time is up and uh, we all have other things, commitment. But so this is just the introduction. Uh, sorry, it's all I could cram into this very short period of time. But it is really about learning to work with the body. Uh, we have a new book coming out, Come to Your Senses and Body Self-Awareness, um, in which we talk about all the exercises that you can do to help people get in their bodies.